Paul, you went to USC and you took screenwriting at USC, correct? Actually, mm -hmm. Columbia. Um, I studied screenwriting at Columbia University and I taught at USC for five years during the 90s. Um, I uh, was a, originally a English major, then a history major uh, at Columbia as an undergraduate. History was about stories, about people doing things, so there was maybe a natural inclination there. And then while I was an undergrad, we used to take our Super 8 sound camera and make comedy shorts. And this is, your audience may not remember this, but there was a time when movies were shown in front of big audiences, not on a little screen. And if you're working in comedy, it's very useful to show your stuff in front of an audience and find out what's working and what isn't. So we would do that. We were making movies, having fun. And then uh, when I was an undergrad, I met Frank Danielle, who uh, took over the film program at Columbia, uh, along with Milos Forman, a director who was his former student. And I met Frank Danielle, took a class with him. And it was, it was something of a revelation, his approach. Uh, I uh, ostensibly sat in on it. I wasn't supposed to be there, but he let me do everything and write. It was a writing workshop. And so I wound up staying there to study as a grad student at Columbia uh, with, with uh, Frank Danielle. And then um, when uh, went out there and started writing, doing my thing, working both in theater and trying to write screenplays. Um, and then moved, when I moved to California, uh, was able to sell a screenplay, to get started with that, and then um, the um, I'd always was interested in teaching because I had a good role model in Frank Danielle, uh, but I didn't feel like I should teach until I'd actually sold something and maybe got something made because it it's like it validates the approach that you've been taught that you would then teach, uh, and then I got an offer to teach at USC, um, and I thought well. I haven't sold anything. And then I realized, oh, I have sold something. Yes, I would like to teach. <laughs> so I wound up uh, teaching there from 93 to 98. And um, that was a, a great experience, uh, great students. Uh, and um, then in 98, I had an offer to come to Chapman University. And the film program was getting underway. It had been existing for a little while, but it, it had become a separate film school in 96, so I was just getting there um, to, I, I was the first screenwriting professor that they, that they hired. Um, and so I've been at Chapman uh, ever since. What were your notions of selling a screenplay when you were undergrad at Columbia versus once you had already been established at USC, come to Dodge College? Well, the, um, to sell a screenplay, I guess you mean when I was a grad student. When I was an undergrad, I didn't know that the <laughs> scripts are, movies are written. I didn't know that. <laughs> sure. But, but what were some of your, your earlier notions of um, selling a screenplay and what it would be like to be a working screenwriter versus having been, whether it be in the trenches or teaching or around career screenwriters? Well, from the get-go, I was interested in, I guess you could say, uh, connecting with an audience. Okay, so that's the impulse. And I saw myself as a filmmaker, not a screenwriter. And uh, Frank Danielle's notion was that it's the same thing, that a film is made before it's shot. It's made on paper first. And a screenplay as a conception of a movie is uh, the equivalent of filmmaking. In fact, Alfred Hitchcock uh, was once quoted as saying, he was, the writer told me this, the writer of Psycho said that um, when they had collaborated on the movie Psycho, the script, and, and the final meeting was just a formality with the producer, they were done with the project, he said Alfred Hitchcock looked really depressed. And the writer asked him, so what's wrong? Is something wrong with the script? He said, no, the script is fine. Now I have to go shoot it. <laughs> so that idea of um, being a filmmaker was what motivated me. Now in terms of the market back then, um, it's... What I understood back then, and I don't think it's really any different now, is that there's nothing you can do to sell a screenplay. There's only things that you can do that increase the likelihood of it, because there's so many variables. Um, and we were, what my approach was, 
um, I guess I, I called it the corporate sneak attack approach. I thought, okay, I'm a writer. I think I've gained a lot of skill with this uh, teacher. Um, but uh, in order to connect with someone who can actually read it, uh, I need to get into the industry. So I took uh, the first job in the industry I could get, which was at Showtime. Um, and that was about maybe six months after I graduated. You know, did temping for a while in New York City and then was able to get a full-time job there just as a secretary. But I was able in that job to meet everybody in the company because I floated, I was like a permanent temp, floating around and meeting pretty much everybody in the company as I worked in the different departments and then um, was able to uh, eventually do script reading and then by that means meet an agent. So you're asking what was the approach to selling a screenplay? Any number of things can happen but my strategy was to try to make connections through work and get someone to read the script and that's how I did it. I um, also would just send out postcards to agents describing my background and also I got recognition from a, fest, from a contest, the Nickel Fellowship and the Writers Guild had a fellowship. So I said, okay, I've been recognized, read my stuff. And just keeping on going, persisting and trying also to keep on with the craft. Uh, it was a day job, but my ideal schedule that I tried to keep was wake up at five in the morning, go for a quick run, then write for a couple hours, and then go to work at nine and coast the rest of the day because the important stuff was done. Um, one bit of advice that I always followed uh, that Frank Danielle had suggested, he said, and I think Lawrence Kasdan, the writer-director, also had a similar idea. He said, don't get a job. When you do your day job and you're earning your you're paying your dues, don't get a, a, a job that's somewhat creative because it can, be, it can satisfy your creative impulse and then you'll, you won't be as passionate about your writing. So for example, don't go into copywriting for PR advertising. Don't go into uh, marketing, things where you're going to write copy or publicity or, or whatever areas might have that because you're going to do that during the day and you're going to create something and then you're going to go home and you're not going to be as hungry for that. So I, when I wound up settling down in, at Showtime, I wound up in research, <laughs> which was quiet. Nobody did anything uh, except uh, generate these statistical reports and I would just sit there and write my screenplays during the, during the day as much as I could. Don't tell anybody at Showtime that. I, I, I tried to tell them I was working hard, but... You know how it is. Um, so, I don't. Know, does that answer your question about the market or the my expectations for how to sell? It just uh, write something that, that people don't want to put down, that grabs them, that can't put down, and then be patient and try working one step at a time to get it out there and to meet people that can maybe uh, get get something done with it. And the first writing actual job that I got. Um, was through a, a friend. And this is in the 1990s, so there was a period of a lot of independent, low-budget stuff going on. And um, I had a degree in this. I'd studied with it. People knew what I'd studied. Um, I had a sample script. Uh, I had a new one by the, a couple of new ones that I'd done. And through that means some director was looking for <coughs> a collaborator on a rewrite of a project. And it was just somebody I knew. And so you get a few thousand dollars and you get uh, something. And then you just get started that way. That was the market back then. Um, and then uh, nowadays, uh, it's in some ways, it's because of the, this outburst of output, of, of product, production happening. I think it's probably a much better situation. You have... Um, I, uh, I like to say George Lucas, when he came into the industry, he, he said that he felt like a seam opened up in history. A seam opened and he and his cohort got in at a very special moment in history and they were able to do these amazing things. And I feel like a seam in history has opened up again with uh, the arrival of streaming and with 
the internet being able to be a distribution place and the the apparent demand for for product now right now it's happening whether all these streaming things things will survive whether something like Quibi can really generate there's a big enough market for a 10 minute webisodes on your cell phone we're going to find out but right now they're they're out there looking for material and they have to generate it so that's a lot of interesting things happening from being at Showtime, what did you learn about a flat script versus a viable script? To me, I'm looking for something. It's, it's pretty basic. It's does it grab me and does it keep me? Uh, it, it, however they accomplish that. Um, is it, um, does it flow? Does it have a, a natural flow? Does it make me want to turn the pages? Um, in my training, I learned somewhat how to do that, and then in subsequent experience and study, and we, we talk about it in the books, um, the, the techniques that you can actually do, there are tools you can use to keep the audience engaged. Um, but essentially that was it. I wasn't looking, or, nor was I instructed to look for any particular type of material. I was just handed things. Um, and some of the things I did were reading stage plays. Like, can we make this into a Showtime on Broadway production. Would that work? Um, sometimes they'd send me off to see a, a theater group, um, that kind of thing. And I'd have to give in a report on my judgment on that. Um, but beyond something that grabs you and keeps your attention, um, I'm not, uh, that, that's pretty much it. Now there was one script and, I, and I, I'll have to, it'll have to <laughs> remain nameless. There was one script that I remember uh, from that time, a couple of years that I was doing that. And I thought, this is funny. This is smart. This is clever. And I thought, I sure hope this gets made somehow. And that was like 1983, okay? 84. And uh, time went on. And then, sure enough, it got made uh, 20 years later. And I thought, oh, that's great. Same title, but by then it had been so rewritten that it was a famous disaster. <laughs> and it was too bad, but that would be an example. There was one that just, the cleverness of the writing, the, um, the, the way the characters were so sharp, the way it flowed was, uh, made me remember it. Um, it stood out in, in the pile of material. So. Interesting. Why do you think so many, whether it's hands got, you know, in the pie, or why do you think that it had such a fresh voice and then it was almost, this is just my word, but destroyed? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, that's too strong, but... Well, it's not too strong. Um, it's the mode of production, I think, in, at least for big movies, is, is uh, a, a problem, I think, because... When you have a big movie, and this wound up being a big studio movie, I just think there's so much pressure that it work, that there's defensive things that happen, and we need to make sure that, the, okay, I'm not sure this draft is right, let's get another writer in, and then, you know, there's, uh, there's so much at stake that it, it has an effect on, on the product, and it can become incoherent. And it is a collaborative medium, and there's always going to be even in the best of circumstances, you, you could have a, a great writer, director, producer, cast, and, and script, and it could still fall flat. It, it's imprecise. But there seems to be, uh, the storytelling tends to flatten out in these situations because one of the elements of, uh, that I talk about more in the first book about dramatic irony, dramatic irony is, of course, Alfred Hitchcock used it, create suspense. To create, to, use, to create a story that involves withholding some information from the audience, some information from the characters uh, when you reveal it, that requires someone who's really watching it and imagining it in their own mind the whole time. And if you've got a lot of people involved, somebody's going to go, oh my goodness, uh, are we sure the audience is going to get this? Well, you better make it clear. And if it's clear, it risks being boring. Um, the three, three, three questions that Frank Danielle shared with us that I, I still think apply uh, to any story. He said there's three questions that you ask when you're crafting a story. Um, 
One, what does the main character want and what are they trying to avoid? Okay, that's question one. Two, what does the main character know and what does the main character not know? And then the third question is, what does the audience know? What does the audience not know? And I don't think most writers realize that you have control over those second two. That the audience, especially when I work with students, the audience doesn't have to know everything all the time. And the characters don't have to know everything all the time. You can withhold some information. You can play games. In fact, um, my takeaway from uh, the book that Connie and I did, this, The Science of Screenwriting, yeah, see it. Uh, that came out last year, oh, was this applying constructivist psychology to the storytelling process. Um, this is something that was uh, in the 80s. Uh, uh, film critic David Bordwell came out with a blockbuster uh, scholarly work in which he squarely placed storytelling uh, in the realm of the constructivist psychology. And that simply means that most of our experience in life, most of our experience of reality, is based not on knowledge, but on inferences that we make based on clues. So that you uh, have uh, what's called uh, top-down processing. Bottom-up processing is you see things, it goes into your brain and you make note of it and you store information. Top-down is you see something in the world and your brain automatically compares what you've experienced before with what you're seeing and then you make a conclusion. You know, there's shortcuts that we're doing all the time. You've never seen the back of this chair, but you've seen chairs, so you assume the back kind of looks like any other chair. It would be a surprise twist if the back of this chair had a, a, a dragon hiding out there, you know, because that's not normal, uh, what you're normally associating with that concept. Um, so in, um, when you're telling a story, you're, you, you, if you understand that that's how audiences are responding, that how they, how they experience a movie is they're looking for clues and they're going to put them together and they're actively involved in constructing a reality. You're the one, as a screenwriter, as a storyteller, you're giving them the clues. You're turning them, again in Frank Danielle's term, you're making them the smartest people in the world. You're making them so brilliant because they're seeing all these clues and you're the one who's actually giving them to them. But they think they're figuring it out and they're going to try to anticipate where you're going because they've seen movies before. The, this is a, a notion, a conceptual framework called a schema. They've seen a movie. They know how movies are. They know they have, tend to have a character who does this and that. And when you know that, you can play games with them. And that's, the, for me, the most fun thing about screenwriting is creating worlds and driving people crazy, getting in their heads. And you can learn how to get in their heads. Um, I'll, I'll just a very simple example. Suppose I show you a movie, there's a shot of a husband and he's buying wife and his wife uh, uh, flowers and chocolate and an anniversary card, okay? Uh, and uh, on his way home from work, okay? Then, meanwhile, you see the wife has got a gun and she's hiding it in the bedroom drawer, okay? What are you gonna think? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? He he's wants to make love and she has other plans, right? Okay. Um, that's where the audience is going to go. And that's, you could pay it off that he comes home with the flowers, she pulls out the gun and shoots him. Or you could then disclose later that the gun, that he's a gun collector and, a surprise, and this is a, a present for him. This is a gun he's been looking for. She saved up for it and she wants to give it to him uh, for an anniversary present. And then you find out that he poisoned the chocolate. <laughs> So you, we just told, a twist is just telling <laughs> um, two stories at the same time, the one the audience thinks it's seeing and the one it's actually seeing. And you're relying, when you do that kind of thing, on the audience's propensity to figure it out and be smarter than you. And once you've got them going that way, you can have all kinds of fun. So that, that's one element of the constructivist psychology that, that we mention in the um, book and have examples of of the filmmakers doing that, you know, doing that kind of thing. Why do two different audience viewers see a scene in different ways? Well, why do they? Mm -hmm. That's again, relates to constructivist psychology, that we all 
um, experience, have different experiences of the world. And we bring different things to the movie. And we're going to have, therefore, different perceptions based on our own experience. I had this interesting moment in a class once where I uh, had a still frame of Nurse Ratched in um, uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. And it's just after she's presided over this rather chaotic uh, group therapy session. And there's, there's a lingering close-up of, of this character. And I had uh, several different interpretations of that look. And one was that she's a sadist and she's happy that she destroyed all these people. The other is that she's really upset that it didn't go better. Another was that she's empathetic. Same exact image, different people bringing different things to it. Um, and so that's one reason why it's virtually impossible to have a, some, a movie that everybody's going to love or that there's one formula that, that will be universally appealing because there are uh, these different kinds of experiences we have. Um, comedy is something that is very specific to, to culture, and that's something else that at least gets a mention in here, um, that uh, comedy tends to be very cultural specific, and that's because a joke is a very bare-bones story. And the audience is the one that brings uh, cultural experience into it in order to get it. Um, so that's why uh, I pointed out again in the book, if you look at IMDb, okay, you look at the top rated movies of all time in their database just as a sample. Um, you don't get to a comedy until number 30 because some people are going to find it funny and some people aren't. Drama may be a little more universal in terms of what, there may be other factors involved. But um, so, yeah, the, the search for a universal, universally successful formula is in vain. In fact, the other thing is that once you have a really successful movie like Star Wars, it exists. So now that's part of people's experience. So any subsequent movie is going to be seen in relation to Star Wars. So if I do the exact same movie again, people are going to think, I saw that already. Or if I do a variation on it, they're going to, they might think, well, I, that's kind of similar to Star Wars, isn't it? You know, it's, it affects how we experience things. So the, uh, fortunately, the quest for a universal formula is, is in vain. It's, it's in, a, in a creative field like this, in the kind of relationship there is between filmmaker and audience. Can you explain the eight sequence template? Sure. This uh, originates in um, two ways, two places. It originates in Hollywood history by the accident of, um, of the one real film, 35 millimeter film that became standardized by the first decade of the 20th century. The first movies uh, by, the, by that time, let's say the, by 1910, they're single real experiences. They're 10 minutes long. And um, for various reasons in the teens, Hollywood split in two directions, from the single reel film to what we call full-length features, multi-reel films, hour and a half to two hours, three hours, um, and in the other direction to the serial, which is a, a reel or two installments, a series. And... Um, the uh, reason you have the, the origin of sequences is that in the U.S., the distribution system was so rigorously one reel a week or two reels a week that when they started to generate full-length feature films, they were still distributed a couple of reels a week. So if you look at manuals of the time, screenwriting manuals, there were about 60 titles that came out in the 19-teens on how to write a photo play because the market was kind of wide open and people wanted to write these things. Um, you'll get instructions about making sure that each reel has a climax to it uh, so that the audience will be interested in seeing the next reel and then they'll see the next one after that. So it was almost like a, a limited series, a feature film. Um, by the late teens, you're seeing them all, the distribution system is changing and you're seeing 
in the theater is what we would normally experience uh, as a fe full-length feature. But the, the idea of writing by the real survived into the 20s and 30s, and you can see the, uh, see the evidence of it in the way the continuity scripts are marked. They're often marked by sequence letter, sequence A, B, C, D. Um, and that is uh, where what we call sequences come, the nomenclature comes from. Um, what Frank Daniel discovered in uh, teaching in the 80s, he uh, discussed the three-act structure in terms of setting up a, a situation, developing it, and then paying it off. Uh, but he found that the students struggled with the middle part of the script because it's intimidating. How do you fill up 60 pages in the middle? And uh, usually 30 pages to set it up, 60 pages in the middle, and 30 pages in the third act. Um, so he revived this idea of sequences. And he said, well, don't think of it in terms of one you know, act of 60 pages. Think of it as four 15-minute scripts that each one builds on the last. And um, so thus the, the sequence approach is born. You're not going to try to tackle a whole 120 pages. Just figure out these 15 minutes, the first one, first 15 minutes, and then the next 15 minutes. Then that's going to lead to some kind of major problem for a character. So then they're going to try to explore the next, for the next 15 minutes. And the, the effect is actually very liberating because you wind up not worrying about how you're going to fill up these pages, but more about how you're going to trim down because now you've got all this material. But it also um, uh, helps you explore a premise really fully. You have a character, let's just take a classic dramatic construction, a character wants something and there's obstacles. Okay, At the end of the first act, they, we know what they want and we know what the obstacles are going to be. Well, what is a character going to do? character doesn't know what the movie's about. character just thinks, oh, this is, this is easy, I can solve this. So they try something. And that's in your conceptualization of the story. The character tries the easiest thing that they can try. And then the filmmaker, the screenwriter, comes up with an obstacle why that doesn't work. And that's maybe 10, 15 minutes. All right, so now they got to try something else. What's that going to be? And you can develop it. And each sequence has its own integrity, ideally. The, the paradigm is that each sequence is going to have three acts also. It's going to have some kind of setup. You don't have to do as much setup because we know the characters, but you're going to have to introduce new circumstances. They're going to try to get something, and then it's going to end with some kind of resolution, usually negative, because if it's positive, maybe the movie's over. But it uh, leads to the next sequence and to the next one. Um, and so you wind up with actually a kind of a nested structure because the scenes, dramatic scenes, have the same three acts. That's why I tend to like three acts. You can, it depends on how you define it. But if you understand it as working with tension, which tension is just putting something in the audience's mind, hope and fear. The character wants something. Are they going to get it or not? That's what I'm wondering about. And if I care about the character, then I'm going to stay tuned because I want to see the answer to that. So it's you don't need more than three acts for that. You just need to set that up, and then you need to develop it, and then you get the answer. So each act, uh, the, the act set up the whole thing. Then each sequence has its own, okay, character wants something, and there's problems. And then each scene has a character that wants something, and there's obstacles. So it's like um, this iterative structure that keeps the audience involved because we're constantly wondering about what, uh, uh, how it's going to come out for the character. And one thing that we also we cover in the, in the book on the science of screenwriting is this, this process of connection to a main character and what the theories are about why we um, uh, have that. And, and it's certainly important if you come into a, if you're in a park and you come in up on a, on a tennis game and two people are really battling each other, it may be interesting, but it's not going to be dramatic to you because you don't know them. But if, if you do know one, if you love one of them, and you know that they just mortgaged their house and put everything on this game, and then you know the other person is a hustler, then every t oh my God, you've got something. It's transformational. But you have to make that connection emotionally. Um, and 
so, um, so to get back about the sequence structure, you have uh, many versions of the uh, three acts in sequences and then in the scenes. And that is the suspense, the tension that keeps us interested. And we also we have a chapter on the contrast in the film. And that plays also into this uh, uh, approach, which is that in order to maintain audience attention, the stimulus has to be changed frequently. Otherwise, you, you zone out. Uh, you, you, you'll lose connection. Uh, you, you'll think about other things. And you need to reset the audience's brain periodically. And filmmakers do it. You can see evidence of it in changing light and dark, loud and soft, fast and slow. But you also see it in tension and release. Tension maintained for too long gets tedious. But if you release it and give us a chance to reset, then you can go on and build it up again and again and again until you reach the, the culmination of the picture. And then finally, you, you try to release it entirely. And, and then people get people to say, yeah, I, I, love, I want to see that movie again. I'm going to tell all my friends I want to see it. <laughs> no. Is it based on a time limit, actually? Is, is there an actual science to the, to the, to the, down to the minute of what we can handle in terms well, of when we're, our mind wanders? I, my understanding is, and this is something that Connie might be able to confirm, but our attention can maybe last about three to five minutes, and then we need to re, reset it somehow. And dramatic scenes tend to be about three to five, three minutes, usually about three pages. And before you need to have some new character enters, you cut away to something, you have a new development, something to scramble it up. So yeah, you, I, I don't think, in fact, the basic premise of this book, the inspiration for making, doing the science of screenwriting was, if you see patterns in, in movies, and you see patterns in the advice about movies, is there a deeper reason for it? Is there a physiological basis for it? There's a, 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 there's a cartoon, a New Yorker cartoon, that has, it kind of illustrates the idea. There's a, a, an auditor, a theater, a movie theater, and it's filled with cats, okay? All the cats are the whole audience. And on screen is a shoe with a shoelace that's loose. Okay, so, okay, a cat's gonna find that completely enthralling. A human being, maybe not so much. But what we do find enthralling, you're gonna see the patterns there. We are gonna look at, at we're gonna look for certain things and be satisfied by certain things. So the physiology kind of determines what we're, um, uh, what we're seeing on screen. So I, I kind of see the book as a, as I mentioned, it's kind of a, a argument settler. Okay, you, you, what's fashionable? What advice is essential? What isn't? What do we need to know? What do we not need to know? Well, it's like, well, go back to the scientific basis for things and see, is there something there that dictates it or is it just an option? So that, that's part of the inspiration for it. What is information dump? Is it a good thing, a bad thing? Oh, well, this is uh, the question of how do you get information to the audience? People want to know why people on screen are doing what they're doing. In order to communicate that, you have to give them background information. Uh, get us, let us know what the circumstances of the movie are. Uh, and the question is how do you how do you convey that information? And the human mind doesn't respond well to raw information that's just dumped on them. We need a context to remember it. And a great example is a recipe. I don't know of anybody who gets a recipe because they're cooking something, reads it once and then goes and does it. It's a constant, what do I need now? What do I need now? That's because it, there's no context for that information. It's just dumped on you. Um, in order for us to get, accept uh, information and take it in, we need, uh, it needs to be embedded in something else. Uh, and it needs to be in little bits and pieces. Um, and so we talk about exposition strategies, which I will be familiar to some people, um, that, that it's, people have written about this. But it's um, giving us clues again, and we start to figure it out who these people are, what they're about. Um, and uh, a puzzle is a great way to get people to take in information. 
pose us something that's mysterious or curious, and right away I want to know what, what what's happening. What are we? Uh, who are these people? And it, it, it's in a way, it's like if you want people to eat, make them eat your eat your dinner. Make sure they're hungry. You know, okay, get them hungry for the information, and then they're ready, ready for it, ready to take it in. Um, and uh, uh, that that's that's what we talk about is information dump. Kind of the mirror opposite of that would be um, like a screen crawl. Okay, this is what happened here and here and here and. Uh, the guy came, he was born here, he raised here, the people won't remember that. Star Wars begins with that screen crawl, but they also, it's part of the style of it. And all the information that's on there gets repeated uh, in various ways during the course of the early part of the story. So it's actually more style than it's necessary for anything else. You're, you're probably not going to remember that. Um, so that's that. We, we do yeah talk about, give examples of different kinds of strategies that filmmakers have used to get us interested in these things. Um, so, but often movies begin with a puzzle, successful ones. Some kind of visual puzzle and then we get curious and then we want to see, uh, uh, get, we get a little bit of information, then we get a little bit more and then finally, before we know it, we're in. But the, the key is to smuggle the information in, in little bits, preferably in the narrative. So that we don't know we're getting that, we're, we don't know we're aware. we're not aware we're getting the information. Like American Beauty, let's say taking that as an example, Can we sort of dissect that in terms of the the puzzle analogy. Right, that's been a long time since I've seen that, but oh, that okay. begins with that disembodied voice. He's talking, and he's is he airborne soaring over the top? Am I remembering it right? I believe so. And then at one, at some point you see Annette Benning's character and she's holding like an open house maybe. Right. And, and she's, you know, she's got the realtor face on and mm -hmm. she's, she's super happy Pollyanna. And then they shut the door and she kind of like has a meltdown. And right. then you go, oh wow, this is really good. You know? Yes. Uh -huh. That's, well, that's um, giving you clues. He doesn't tell you what happens. I think he says in a year I'll be dead. And that's, creates anticipation, of course. The key in this, when we talk about page turner, we're talking about anticipation. I'm into it, I want to anticipate what's happening, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, that's a little clue that gets thrown out there and it makes us wonder. In fact, that's something uh, in the first book, the screenwriting, the sequence approach, uh, it's uh, called a deadline. I mean, I didn't invent that term, but it's the term that narratologists use. A deadline is a, just what it sounds. In that movie, it's exactly what it is. He's going to be dead in a year. Um, but a deadline is a certain time limit that people are working under, the characters are working under. You know, I got six days to get to X. I've got to be at home by midnight or X. That's a very useful tool, um, the, the deadline. Um, but, uh, we're, oh, okay, so with uh, American Beauty, right, just give you a little clue um, make us curious, then you have there the, a clue that suggests somebody who's happy and then you give us a surprise twist, we learn more. And then now we're curious and the curiosity keeps propelling us in. How does a character arrive for screenwriters? Is it something that's very vivid in their mind, like almost this is a real person even if it's not? Or is it a hazy, vague thing that develops over many drafts? I think it, ultimately it's going to depend on the writer and I've known writers that work, they have a great character and they just want to see what kind of uh, circumstance would be right for this character uh, to explore. In fact, Frank Daniel used to say that you could see um, a story as like a scientific experiment where you take a known substance and an environment that you know and you put them together and see how they react, uh, find out what, what happens. You want to find... Uh, a character, some people will go with that first. Okay, this great character, what kind of circumstance would challenge them the most, make them explode, basically? Um, and But most people tend to come up with a story, I find, first, and then they explore, well, what kind of character can, can that be, um, uh, would work for my story that I have? And um, in terms of how ri different writers work, um, I, I, I know some writers will based on a person they know, and sometimes that's very useful. Um, and uh, the advantage of that, even if it's the, the person they know has nothing to do with that kind of story, 
is that you can get real specific because you know the character. You know, you know that how they are, and you're not gonna. They're not gonna. They're capable of some things. They're not capable of other things. Uh, um, but uh, so, um, but I've been in a situation where I based a script on a person who was in the story, and then at the end of the draft, I was like, that's not the right person for that story. So I wound up going through. I call it a major characterectomy. <laughs> Change the. I bet that hurt. Right. Well, actually, it worked out in the end. Oh, good. Okay. Um, but uh, so, yeah. So different writers have different processes, but. The, the key for me is to make it specific as you can. You don't, I do have students who will say, uh, Joe, 19, is a, a typical freshman. It's like, there's no typical freshman. There's no typical anything. Everybody's, a little, everybody's unique, and you look for that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that's, that's been, been my experience of it. What about the science of connecting to character? Right. That is... Um, Again, something that, that we dedicate a chapter to. Um, one term that gets used that I think can limit imagination is the idea of a hero. A hero, uh, we talk about the hero's journey, and then people say, well, if I got a hero, the connotation of a hero is someone who's heroic, someone who's likable and does brave things. That's not necessarily what's meant by the hero's journey, but that's the connotation that people have. And the fact is that people tend to like to watch people with flaws, and you don't want to uh, eliminate that. You have people that aren't necessarily admirable. In fact, uh, one theory we talk about, uh, 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 I believe a psychologist named uh, Jonathan Gottschall has a book on this, is that um, that we watch characters who are flawed because we learn from them? Um, that that uh, again, quoting I can get you the exact psychologist who said it. Uh, he said uh, that stories are flight simulators for life. Like you can uh, a flight simulator, so you can make mistakes and not die, and a story is watching other people make mistakes. So you can learn to not do those things. And so it's the question of, does your character have to be likable? Well, the answer is, it's all about what's called the primacy effect, first impressions. If they're, the example of uh, J.P. McMurphy, okay, he, in the Cuckoo's Nest, how likable is someone who's committed statutory rape, who's uh, gets into fights all the time and is in jail and slacks off and doesn't want to work, just wants to play cards. You tell someone, no, I got this character, you're going to say, I don't want to spend time with that character. That's who he is. But when you first meet him, he's not doing those things. When you first meet him, he's like being released and he's like whooping it up for joy. And then he's out there hanging out with people and trying to encourage people and looking at their cards and things. So our first impression of him is that, and that allows us to bond with him. And then, as the course of the story, we get to see his flaws come out and how they play into the circumstance. Um, that movie um, in Bruges is the same thing. You know, you have a, a, a character who's, uh, who's a hired killer, and he killed a little kid uh, by accident, but he still he killed a kid, and now he's, he's wondering what to do. But you don't know that. <laughs> When you first meet him, he's like a, a little boy complaining that he's stuck in this place looking at museums. And there's a dark side to it. But we get to know him that way, and then we gradually learn about him. And by then, we're on his side. So, um, but the question of connecting to a main character is what exactly happens? We talk about it again in that book. There are different theories. Um, there is this idea, of course, that you like a character, so you sympathize with them. But there's also a theory that you, you become the character, that you literally go through a process uh, that one theorist argues is the basis for morality, that you go through the process where you can feel the pain that the other person feels. Like uh, the example given is a person decides, a woman decides he's going to murder the old man next door, and then imagines what it'd be like to be murdered, and then imagines that they are the one being murdered. It feels the pain, 
and says, no, I'm not going to do that. So that you, it's more than just liking a character, it's actually a process by which you merge and become uh, emotionally connected. There's another, I don't know if we talked about this in the book, but there's a, this notion of mirror neurons too in the brain, that, the, that looking at a chocolate pie, what, looking at someone eating a chocolate pie fires the same pleasure neurons in your brain as you eating it. So that you, that's not settled science, I guess, yet, but there are strong connections that, that audiences make with, with the character that allows them to go on this journey and, and purge themselves you know, of emotion, as Aristotle said many years ago. Um, and I think it's a, this, this poses a challenge, oddly enough, for virtual reality. Because virtual reality, a few years ago, they were really struggling to come up with a way to make it a mass consumption product like a hit, like you have Jaws or Star Wars or at the movie theater. You'll have a similar thing going on with uh, public theater where they're playing, doing something. And the problem with that is that you, when you surrender to a movie character, you're surrendering. You're not there anymore. You stop existing. And you don't have agency. You don't do anything. You're just watching it, and you're enthralled, and you are it. But if you're in virtual reality, you still have agency. You're not the person there. You're actually making decisions, so you're inevitably pulled out of it. And great for a game. I'm, I'm glad they haven't developed them too far, because I'd be addicted, and I'd never do anything but play virtual reality games. It's wonderful, but this process of audience connection with a character, whether it's in movies or a storyteller um, is uh, in, involves real close connection, and therefore learning. And you uh, see a character go through what we call character arc. That's when they become consciously aware of something they didn't know before. That's a lesson they they have to learn. Or you have a, a tragedy where the character never learns, but we learned that they did something that they couldn't recover from. They didn't learn in time. Uh, or you get something really twisted like Cuckoo's Nest where the character is heroic and we don't want him to learn. We want him to always be heroic. It's just that it's a tragedy what happened, but something else happened. So there's, there's variations um, on that. What is a dangling cause? A, a dangling cause is one of the tools that keeps the audience anticipating. And it's, it comes from, uh, I believe, French formalism, uh, th narratology, narrative theory. And the, I simply stated, we, we respond, we talk about this in the book, um, to cause and effect. We look for cause and effect. We are geared toward understanding the world that way. And it's, it's easy for us to follow stories, narrative uh, events, when there is a cause and effect that's evident. Uh, dangling cause is a cause that you don't get the effect right away, but you anticipate. So, uh, boy likes girl, boy kisses girl, cause and effect. Boy likes girl, boy says, I'm going to kiss her before the weekend is over. Dangling cause. We're going to pick up that effect later, but it dangles over in the audience's consciousness. So it's one of the tools in the screenwriting, the, the, sequence approach that we talk that I talk about that helps keep the audience wondering what's going to happen next. I mentioned deadline, that's one telegraphing sort of what is coming, literally. Uh, there's an appointment at five o'clock today, we're going to meet at Jerry's Juiceteria. Tell the audience that. When you cut there, you don't have to explain why we're there, you've been told. Uh, the deadline, like uh, the Hurt Locker, or even, yeah, the, uh, uh, the one, um, American Beauty. American Beauty. Mm -hmm. We know when it's, that when he's close to being dead, it's gonna, the movie's going to be over. Um, there's dramatic irony where we are engaged because we're going to see what happens when the truth comes out. And then there's dramatic tension, which is when we're um, wondering what, how would the person get what they want or not, or will they escape what they want or not. And I, I think if there's anything in my approach, what we're trying to do here, that I emphasize with the students is there's always talk about rules. Should I follow the rules? Should I break the rules? Should I do this or that? And 
to me, the problem with rules is, or understanding rules, or even if you want to call them guidelines, is that if you follow the rules, congratulations, you're one down, you're following, you're following, you're not leading, you're following. And having followed them, the rules don't applaud and they don't pay you anything. The better question to ask is what's the effect? What's the effect of my choice in the story on my audience? Because now I'm one up, I'm in charge of what's happening. I'm in charge of how I'm affecting my audience. And the tools that are in these books, that's the idea. What are the choices that you didn't know you have that you have that you can use to affect the audience? And audiences do applaud and they pay you. So I like my students to be in the power position where they're figuring out what they want to do rather than what, whether they can follow something. So. so true or false, if we focus on the audience, everything will fall into place with our screenplay. If we focus on the audience, everything will fall into place. True or false, no nuance. Um, we focus on the audience, we, can, we have a better shot of succeeding at connecting with an audience. That's the closest I can come. So focusing on the audience, keeping structure in mind, sequences, things like that, okay? Yep, and it gives you that freedom. You know, if you know what they're anticipating, you can play games. Um, you, you, how do you break a rule? Well, Alfred Hitchcock, I don't want to give it away, but Alfred Hitchcock exploited the fact that in a Hollywood movie, there's a main character, and the main character is a star, and the star lives through the movie. Maybe they die in the end, but they live through the movie. Knowing that, that's what the audience is expecting. It, what happens if you kill them off 40 minutes in? Well, that's going to have a huge effect. Well, but you can do other things to make up for the loss. If you understand what the function of a character is, then you can create, do something else to compensate for that and keep the audience interested even though the character is gone. Uh, I'll leave you with one joke, and I know we've got to end, but it's, it's like this. If you were to write a book on knock-knock jokes, what would you do? You would, say, you would look at all the knock-knock jokes. you say, it's very simple. Here, these are the rules. Um, you say, knock-knock. The other person says, who's there? You give a partial answer. They say, partial answer, who? And then you um, give them the, the, the punchline. Okay? That's the rules. That's my book, and that's, that's how you, if you want to be successful. Okay. Knock-knock. Um, Oh, who's there? Control freak. Okay, now here's where you say control freak who. <laughs> See, I just broke the rules. Mm -hmm. But what I was doing was trying to elicit a laugh. The point was the effect, not the rules. It's knowing what you think, exploiting the fact that you have a schema, an understanding of what a knock-knock joke is, I can play games.